Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Arctic Reptile Ranch. On today's episode, I'm serving up pancakes. Wait, not these light, fluffy, delicious morsels. I'm talking about pancake tortoises. So let me put these away and get the real stars of this episode out. I'll be right back. All right, welcome back. In this episode, we're gonna take a look at one of my favorite types of tortoise in the entire world, the pancake tortoise. And here are two of mine, pie and maple. Pie is a male, maple is a female. Pancake tortoises are one of the most unique tortoises in the world because as you can tell from their shape, they're a flat tortoise. They're not highly domed like most other tortoises are. The females are a little bit more domed, that gives them room for eggs when they're developing, but overall, they're a flat tortoise, and that's where you get the name pancake. Another very unique aspect of them is their shells. As you can see from these pictures, their shells never quite close up. From the time they're small till they grow up, parts of their shells remain hollow. In fact, their plastron on the bottom of their shell, it stays open. The only thing covering it up is the hard keratin scoops that you can see right here. If you wanted to find one of these guys out in the wild, you would have to travel all the way over to the continent of Africa. They come from small areas in Kenya and Tanzania. And back in 2003, a small group was also found in Zambia. One other unique aspect about these guys that they're famous for is their ability to climb. They live on rock outcroppings, so they have to be able to climb up to get in between where the rocks are. One interesting fact about these pancake tortoises is the way they hide and stay safe. As you can see, they're in a pretty close quarters. When they feel threatened, what they'll do is they'll stick their arms out and kind of wedge themselves in there so that it's harder to pull them out. And this keeps predators from pulling them out and eating them. In fact, the only time that they're actually vulnerable is when they're out grazing and birds of prey can see them. When I go to grab her, see she raises herself up and tries to get nice and wedged in there also. So while their slightly hollow flexible shell allows them to get into such tight spaces, it's really their arms that keep them safe inside here and keep them from being pulled out. For a long time, people thought that they inflated themselves the way some lizards do to, to keep themselves from being pulled out. But that's been shown, in fact, you've seen it right here, to be not true. In the enclosure that I've put together for them, I've tried to simulate some of the natural crevices that they would get into in rocks out in the wild. Come on over and you can have a closer look. I'll show you what I've done. Let me put these guys away. As you can see, I've made a stack of slate tiles in their enclosure and this is where they spend the majority of their time. Like all of my enclosures, there's a cocoa core topsoil mix that is in here and when you dig just below, there's moisture for when they want to get a little bit more humidity and create their own microclimate. There's PVC water tubes that feed everything from the bottom up, that way the top stays drier. This is heated during the daytime by this PAR 38 floodlight. It's illuminated by LED lights and it's heated at nighttime by a heating coil that goes, a heating cord, it's a rubber heating cord, it goes back here in between these two these two slats and it also goes beneath of it. I have it set on a dimmer so that it's not going at full power. At full power it was making these tiles close to 100 degrees all the time which at nighttime and even during the day is a little bit too warm on their bellies. You want to give them a, somewhere warm at night that uh, takes the chill off but it's not a, a replacement for a basking spot. So down here at any given time it feels slightly warm to me and that tells me that it's about 85 degrees down there. In here, it's also warm, it's about 80 degrees in here, and this, top, this part up top is kept warm by the light, and basically the conduction, once the heat hits here, it radiates out and heats up their entire slate. These guys are cared for similar to most other tortoises. Their habitat in Ken Kenya and Tanzania is in the grasslands but they live on, on rock outcroppings. So their diet consists of similar items that your leopard tortoises and sulcata tortoises would be eating. Like all my other tortoises, they get fresh greens, they get Zoomed tortoise diet mixed into it, and they also get 
get orchard grass hay mixed into their diet as well so they have a good amount of roughage. Now of course every couple of days these guys are also getting Missouri and Marion Zoological Diet to supplement. They get the normal calcium supplements that I give everybody else. And you can see they're, they're growing pretty well. In fact, this guy, I've had him since he was a hashling. As you can see in this picture here, and you can see they're, you know, they don't want anybody touching their head, but they're really not that shy. Right now, Pi is demonstrating some of their climbing skills as he climbs straight down. These guys are also able to right themselves on their back for their size, kind of long limbs and longer necks. So it's very easy for them to flip themselves back over if, if they're on their backs. Because they can climb nearly vertically, they're more likely to put themselves in situations that would make them fall backwards. So, the ones that were able to flip themselves over on their own survived and made babies similar to themselves. Although these have been kept in pretty good numbers since the 1990s, there are very few references on these. They, they show up from time to time in tortoise books as a side paragraph, but there are no books that I've ever found specifically on pancake tortoises. Your best reference is the tortoise forms that I recommend all the time. There's a couple of natural history books, but what I've done is I've gone into my school's library and just searched research papers on the database to learn more about these guys. I learned a lot more than I'd ever known about these guys. In fact, that's how I found out that they don't just occur in Kenya and Tanzania. I found out one paper where they found them in Zambia also. One alarming aspect about the pancake tortoise is their status in the wild is kind of unknown. There have been several field research studies done to try to determine how many of these are left in the wild. The problem is they were imported in great numbers before there were any rules or they realized how many were leaving the countries. So uh, their home, one of their home countries of Kenya have banned export on these guys since the 1990s. And Tanzania still allows for, for transport. They're currently listed as a CITES 2 animal, but anybody that's done any field research on these guys has been promoting that these guys get listed as a CITES 1 animal because there are so few of them left in the wild due to over collection for the pet trade. Fortunately for this animal, they are bred in decent numbers in captivity, so there's really no longer need to collect them out of the wild. Now, every so often you might want to get a wild one to boost your genetic line, but overall, there's no need to try to pull these guys from the wild. In fact, my pair, I've caught them mating a few times, but I don't know if it's ever quite stuck because I'm still haven't haven't had any eggs yet. But we're hopeful that in the future, we're going to make some little tiny short stacks from these two. So, thank you for tuning into this episode, learning about the pancake tortoise. Hope you've enjoyed it. Stick around. There will be more episodes to follow of the various species I keep up here in Alaska on the Arctic Reptile Ranch. Have a great day. The final two minutes of this video are just the pancakes wandering around their enclosure doing tortoise things.